Welcome back. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I was just talking in the podcast channel before I, I started recording, and I could hear the audible change between my regular chit-chatting voice and my YouTube voice. I don't know. I think it's funny. I don't think it's an intentional thing. I, I, I can tell a difference, though, between my regular voice, like just conversation voice, and my YouTube voice. I could tell uh, the change took place. Anyway, so I believe we were on ch uh, paragraph 22. That's where we left off. Chapter 2, paragraph 22. So let's just take a look here. Let's read paragraph 21 just for a little refresher so that we know where we were. So it says, What can we learn about pure worship from examples set by the patriarchs? Like them, we're surrounded by people, maybe even family members, who could distract us from giving Jehovah exclusive devotion. Okay, it's talking about how we should be placing... Uh, the Watchtower Society above our family members uh, in terms of importance. So the Watchtower Society should always come first. Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah, quote-unquote, the governing body, should always come first. That's what this paragraph is telling us. And it says, To resist such pressure, we must develop strong faith in Jehovah and be convinced that his righteous standards are best. Now, in this sentence, they're saying to resist the pressure of natural affection, to resist the natural feelings of love that we have for people, for family. We have to throw our lives uh, and our beings into the Watchtower Society, into Jehovah's Witnesses, into this religion. That's what this is saying. And interestingly enough, long and long ago, when I was a kid, I remember them talking about, oh, let me think for a minute, what was, it, what was the phrase? In the end times, there will be lovers of money and greed and, and people having no natural affection. That was the key phrase, no natural affection. I specifically remember seeing that Bible verse and having it quoted to me. Sometimes, like my mother would quote that, that kind of thing to me. Heard a lot of cherry-picked Bible verses like that when I was little. Well, since then, they've updated the silver sword, quote-unquote, the Jehovah's Witness translation. They've updated it, and they actually took that verse out. Well, they didn't take the verse out. They just changed the wording. So now it's no longer no natural affection. It's something different. I don't remember what it is. But point is, Jehovah's Witnesses have no natural affection, or that's what they strive for. They're trying to suppress the natural affection that they have for family members. That's what they're doing by, you know, this shunning arrangement that they have, by this disfellowshipping arrangement, quote-unquote. They're trying to suppress natural affection. So I find it interesting that they speak out and say everybody's going to have, uh, they're going to be lacking natural affection when they are the worst um, perpetrators of this. Okay, so that's where we left off last time. Now we're on the subheading, A Nation Devoted to Pure Worship. And this is paragraph 22. It says, Jehovah provided Jacob's descendants with the law code, leaving them in no doubt about what he required of them. If they obeyed Jehovah, they would become his special property and a holy nation. Those are in quotes. I guess they're quoting Exodus 19, 5 and 6 there. Notice how the law emphasized the four key elements of pure worship. Okay, so that was 22. That's kind of a short paragraph. I'm just looking... Um, Okay, yeah. So the questions that go with these paragraphs, I haven't been reading the questions, but because I, I feel like that's kind of a brainwashy part of Jehovah's Witness literature. Reading the questions, dictating the answer back that they want you to give. So I'm not really reading the questions, not even bothering with them, but the questions for these paragraphs go with paragraphs 22 through 24. So... 
22 is a little bit short. Let's continue on through 24. Jehovah clearly identified who the recipient, italics, of the Israelites' worship should be. This is a quote. You must not have any other gods besides me, declared Jehovah. The sacrifices they offered to him had to be of the highest quality, italics. For example, animal sacrifices were to be sound, without any defect. The Levites benefited from the gifts given to Jehovah. Huh, okay. But they too made personal offerings. What they gave had to come from among the very best of all the gifts given to them. Okay, so I'm kind of confused here. As far as I know, this could be incorrect, so don't quote me on this, but... I believe Israel had 12 tribes. It was basically the 12 sons of Israel. And each of those sons had children, like Levi and, you know, all of, all of the other kids. Um, they all had children, and each group had a different job to do. So the Levites, as far as I know, were kind of the treasurers of Israel, like they handled the Ark of the Covenant and any money that was going in and out of Israel. Like I said, that could be incorrect, but I'm pretty sure that's how it worked. So what? It's saying here, the Levites benefited from the gifts given to Jehovah, but they too made personal offerings. I guess that people were giving their sacrifices and their money to the Levites as a sacrifice to Jehovah or something? I I guess that's what they're talking about here. Well, let's continue reading. We'll see if it expands on it a little bit. Regarding the manner, italics, in which they worshipped, the Israelites were given specific direction about what, where, and how sacrifices should be made to Jehovah. In total, they were given more than 600 laws to govern their behavior, and they were told, Be careful to do just as Jehovah your God has commanded you. You must not turn to the right or to the left. Okay, so I guess here it's saying, yeah, so they, it says, In total, they were given more than 600 laws to govern their behavior. Right. So I believe what they're talking about here is the 613 commandments. The first 10 aren't really separated from the other 603 in any way, just that they're the first 10. It it starts listing them in the Bible, starts listing the, the 10 commandments, and it moves on to the other 603. And it's things like, you can't put two seeds in the same hole, like literal seeds in the same literal hole when you're farming. You can't wear cotton and linen blends, aka polyester, I believe is made as a uh, cotton and linen blend. You can't uh, eat shellfish. Uh, This is the part where they talked about gay or homosexuality being an abomination and all of this other stuff, right? So here's my question. Supposedly, Jesus coming back Uh, pretty much unraveled those Old Testament laws. We no longer have to do animal sacrifices because Jesus came back and died in our place. So now we don't have to continue killing animals to make up for our sins. We don't have to live by those old laws anymore. We can eat pork now. That's, I believe, that's one of the 613 commandments. We can now eat shellfish. We can now wear cotton and linen blends. The old 613 laws that were listed in the Old Testament have now been undone because Jesus came and died for us. I, I believe that's how it works. Now, there are some people who believe that the old laws have not been undone. They're called Messianic Jews, and they believe that Jesus coming back didn't undo those Old law, old Testament laws. We still have to live by them. But they still believe that Jesus did come back and die for our sins. So they basically live in a Jewish way, a Jewish life, Jewish culture, Jewish laws and rules, but they do believe that Jesus came back, died for us, and was the Messiah, and all of that. 
So as far as I can tell, if you believe that Jesus came back and died for our sins, and you're not this small sect Messianic Jews, then you don't live by the 613 commandments anymore, right? You don't live by the 10 commandments anymore. Jesus replaced those laws with two new ones, which are love your neighbor as yourself and love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, body, strength, whatever else. Now, that could be a completely incorrect assessment, so don't quote me on that, but I've been dealing with religion for a long time, so I don't think it's far off base if it is. Anyway, okay, so let's continue reading here. I think we were on paragraph 24. It says, did it really matter where the Israelites offered their sacrifices? Yes, Jehovah instructed his people to build a tabernacle, and it became the center for pure worship. At that time, if the Israelites wanted their offerings to be approved by God, they had to bring them to the tabernacle. What mattered more, however, was an Israelite's motive, italics. Oh, by the way, this is paragraph 25 now. What mattered more, however, was an Israelite's motive for offering his gift. He had to be motivated by heartfelt love for Jehovah and for his standards. Read Deuteronomy 6, 4-6. When the Israelites merely went through the motions associated with pure worship, Jehovah rejected their sacrifices. Through the prophet Isaiah, Jehovah revealed that he's not deceived by an empty show of devotion, saying, This people, dot, 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 ellipsis, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far removed from me. Every time they put an ellipsis in there, I'm interested to see what they cut out. Because that, that basically means... They cut something out. That's what that means. I actually got on Amazon a while back and bought some old school Jehovah's Witness books. Like I bought the old Revelation book from the 1980s, 1990s. I bought the old, um, what, what was it called? It was called How Did Life Get Here by Creation or Evolution or, or, or something like that. Yeah, I bought that book too. And they misquote people so much in that blue book. It is an obnoxious amount. Richard Dawkins being one of the people they misquoted. And they misquote them by putting ellipses in, like they do here in this book. They put ellipses in to cut out the relevant part of the quote. So let me just look this up. It says, this people, ellipsis, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far removed from me. Let's see if this holds true to what the Bible is trying to communicate. Let's just look it up here. It says, this is Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship, they, their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. Okay, so back to the Jehovah's Witnesses quote. This people, ellipsis, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far f removed from me. Okay, that, I, you know, I guess that's a fair quote. Although I really think they should just put the whole thing in. Just no more ellipses. We can't trust ellipses. We should just cut those out completely. Just put the whole thing in. I don't care if it's hard to make sense of with the whole quote. I feel like quoting in its entirety is very important sometimes especially when you have a credibility problem, like Jehovah's Witnesses do. Okay, so here's the next subheading, Worship at the Temple. This is paragraph 26. Centuries after Israel settled in the Promised Land, King Solomon built a center for pure worship that was far grander than the tabernacle. At first, Jehovah was the only recipient, italics, of the sacrifices offered at this temple. Solomon and his subjects offered vast quantities of sacrifices of high quality italics in the manner outlined in God's law. So they're still highlighting those four words. Quality, manner, um, what were the four? I don't remember them now. Uh, let me just scroll up a little bit here, see if I can find them. Yeah, recipient, quality, manner, and motive. Those were the four words that they were kind of highlighting as extra important, so... Anyway, back to the paragraph. It says, At first, Jehovah was the only recipient of the sacrifices offered at this temple. 
Solomon and his subjects offered vast quantities of sacrifices of high quality in the manner outlined in God's law. However, the cost of the uh, however the cost of the building and the number of sacrifices were not what made worship at the temple acceptable to Jehovah. What mattered was the motive of those offering the gifts, motive in italics. Solomon emphasized that point at the, de- at the dedication of the temple. He said, Let your heart be complete with Jehovah our God by walking in his regulations and by keeping his commandments as on this day. Okay. One thing I want to make note of, In the last episode, I was talking a lot about how I cringe at the name Jehovah. It's like such a cringy name, right? Jehovah's Witnesses who listened to that would be like, See? See? I told you! The name Jehovah makes demons shudder. And Telltale over here is shuddering. That means he's possessed by a demon. I guarantee you that is what Jehovah's Witnesses would think if they saw that podcast and heard me talking about it. I do want to make note that um, if Satan is real and if I am his agent, he has given me fame and fortune, I guess you could say. Uh, Well, not not so much fortune, but fame at the very least. So thanks, Satan. I appreciate that. That's pretty awesome. I don't really buy that he's a real being in the first place, but aside from that, I just, here's the thing. I've talked to other ex-Jehovah's Witnesses about it, too. And they seem to have an issue with the name Jehovah, too. It's because I've noticed a lot of the time, when we come out of this religion, this cult, we start to realize all of the bullshit that they just piled on to us over years and years, and how Jehovah isn't really God's name. It isn't even close to God's name. It's nowhere to be found in the Bible. And the fact that we've been using this pretend made-up name around people for so many years, to me, it's an embarrassment. I'm embarrassed that I used that, that name unironically in everyday life, in real sentences that I said to people, when it's factually incorrect. And now I have to face those people and accept the fact that they know that I know that I was spouting bullshit for years and just buying, just bought the whole thing hook, line, and sinker, just lapping it all up. It's embarrassing and depressing that I believed such garbage for so long. And I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way. I mean, I'm sure just about every ex-member of a religion who's listening to this probably feels similarly. Ultimately, it wasn't our fault. I was born into it, personally. A lot of us are born into it. But for those of us who weren't born into it, I, I, you know, I can't speak to any specific situation, any one person's specific situation, but I know that religious people like to prey on people who are emotionally vulnerable who are in an emotionally vulnerable state. And a lot of the time, that's what happens. We find ourselves in a religion because we just needed something or somebody at a certain point in our lives. And here are these religious people offering us that something that we felt like we needed. So I don't think I would call it any one person's fault. It wasn't my fault that I believed this garbage. The important part is that I don't buy it anymore. But the fact that I ever said this bullshit name unironically is cringeworthy to me. And it makes me cringe just just saying it now. So anyway, that's why. It's not because I'm possessed by demons. Although if you want to believe that, feel free. That's fine with me. It's just because I said it unironically for so long. Anyway, okay, back to where we were. I think we were on 26. Now, let's read 27, paragraph 27. Unfortunately, the Israelites did not continue to follow the king's wise counsel. They failed to fulfill one or more of the key aspects of pure worship. The kings of Israel and their subjects allowed their hearts to be corrupted. They lost faith in Jehovah, and they abandoned his righteous standards. 
Time and time again, Jehovah lovingly sent prophets to correct them and to warn them of the consequences of their actions. And now that here they're quoting Jeremiah 7.13, so on and so forth. Noteworthy among those prophets was the faithful man Ezekiel. He lived at a critical time in the history of pure worship. <laughs> okay. Something else I wanted to make note of here real quick is the other day, I think it was in one of these podcasts, I saw a Bible verse called J-A-S, period. And then, I don't remember, 127 or something. J-A-S, 127. And I didn't know what that abbreviation was. Well, I ended up looking it up later out of curiosity. Turns out it's James. It's James 127 or whatever. I don't remember what it was now. But J-A-S, the abbreviation is James. Had no idea. Okay, so that was the end of that subheading. Here's the next subheading. It's called Ezekiel sees, uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel sees pure worship corrupted. Okay, so this is paragraph 28 now. We have, okay, so chapter, I think this is chapter two. It has a total of 31 paragraphs in it. This is 28. Ezekiel was intimately acquainted with worship at the temple, but uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel was intimately acquainted with worship at the temple built by Solomon. His father was a priest and would have taken his turn serving at the temple. Ezekiel's early years likely were happy. His father, no doubt, taught him about Jehovah and the law. In fact, about the time that Ezekiel was born, the book of the law was found in the temple. The reigning monarch, good King Josiah, was so moved by what he heard that he increased his efforts to promote pure worship. See, this is one thing that I, I love to find in Jehovah's Witness literature, is they say, okay, it says, Ezekiel's early years were likely, uh, likely were happy. They're assuming this stuff. I mean, there are a lot of assumptions built into everything. It may seem like a small basic thing, a small basic assumption, but that stuff adds up. I mean, those small assumptions add up. You can't assume things like that when you're dealing with old scrolls like this. And honestly, basically nothing in the Bible is trustworthy as history. We've found time and time again, we have historical documents for events that are mentioned in the Bible, and the Bible gets it wrong. I mean, the Bible gets it really wrong. Okay, that was paragraph 28. Here's 29. Like the faithful men before him, Ezekiel fulfilled the four requirements of pure worship. As a consideration of the book of Ezekiel, I'm sorry, as a consideration of the book of Ezekiel shows, he served Jehovah exclusively, gave his best continually, and obediently did what Jehovah asked of him, and in a manner he required. Ezekiel did all of this because he was motivated by heartfelt faith. The same could not be said of the majority of his contemporaries. Ezekiel had grown up listening to the prophecies of Jeremiah, who began his work in 647 BCE. Notice they use BCE. Stands for Before Common Era. We'll get back to that in a second. Ezekiel had grown up listening to the prophecies of Jeremiah, who began his work in 647 BCE, and who zealously warned of Jehovah's coming judgment. Yeah, they use BCE. So, as far as I know, I, you know, I have to preface everything I say with that. I'm not sitting here doing the research. I'm just reading this book and talking about what, what's right off the top of my head. You know, this is actually the first time I'm reading this book, too. So don't quote me on anything that I say, you know, that, that's, that's intended to be factual or not. You should really look it up. If I'm, if I'm giving a factual quote here, especially on the podcast. Uh, but BCE, I believe that stands for Before Common Era. And then CE stands for Common Era. Uh, AD stands for Anno Domini, which means, I believe, the year of our Lord. And then BC means Before Christ. So the more scholarly, professional, secular 
notation is BCE and CE, before common era and common era. Uh, that's what you'll find usually in research papers. But if it's a religious text, it's almost always BC or AD. So anyway, I just find it interesting that they're, they're, they're listing it as BCE here. I guess this is just one of the ways they want to separate themselves from the world's um, notations. They don't want to be part of the worldly system that uses BC before Christ. Okay. So that was 29. Here's 30. Ezekiel's inspired writings reveal how far God's people had strayed from serving him. When Jehovah began to discipline Judah, Ezekiel was among those taken captive to Babylon. Although taken prisoner, Ezekiel was not being punished. Jehovah had work for him to do among his exiled people. The stunning visions and prophecies recorded by Ezekiel outline how pure worship would be restored in Jerusalem. But they also do much more. They give insight into how pure worship will eventually be completely restored for all who love Jehovah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, they said at the beginning of this one, read Ezekiel 8.6. So I think that was referencing Ezekiel 8.6. Like I said, though, I'm not going to read the Bible verses. Um, it's a little bit time-consuming. I guess we could probably read them on our own if we want to. I may read a couple here and there. Okay, that was 30. This is 31. In the sections of this publication that follow, we will gain a glimpse into the realm where Jehovah resides, discover just how completely pure worship was defiled, learn how Jehovah restores and defends his people, and peer into the future when every, hu every living human will worship Jehovah. That's creepy. In the following chapter, we'll consider the first vision Ezekiel recorded. It impresses on our imagination a picture of Jehovah and the heavenly part of his organization, emphasizing why he alone is worthy of exclusive pure worship. Worthy of exclusive pure worship? Really, worthy of it? So, my daughter Kylie, she would not exist if it weren't for me. I in, for lack of a better term, produced this child, right? Her mother certainly produced this child. She is a product of our time and work. I do not demand worship from her. I would never demand worship from her. Why does God feel entitled to our worship and our love? Entitled to it, no matter what. He deserves it. He alone deserves it. Nobody else deserves the exclusive, pure love and worship. Think of, I mean, put this in context. Think about this, really. Think about what kind, what you, what you would think of me if I said that about Kylie. If I expected that from her. You would think I was a monster, honestly. And that's some messed up shit right there. And we've heard this so much throughout our lives, on and on, that it sounds normal to us. There's nothing normal about that. There's nothing okay about that mindset. We need to reanalyze everything that we were taught when we were religious. That's what I had to do when I left reassess everything every phrase every cliche you ever heard reassess it and think to yourself is that right is that honestly how we should view the world is that a healthy way to view things more often than not i find it's really not a healthy way to view things the cliches that i picked up in religion anyway okay so that was paragraph 31 um, and it was kind of summarizing what we're going to be talking about in the following para uh, I'm sorry, the following chapters. God, I keep mixing those two things up. So there, this is the bottom of the page. This is page 24. It says, Your place in pure worship. One, why did Jehovah reject worship from Cain but accept it from Abel? Two, what did you learn about pure worship from the examples of the patriarchs? The patriarchs being Abraham, Jacob, so on. 
and then three. Which section of this publication are you especially looking forward to studying? This is fascinating, really fascinating. I, I, I'm excited to read the whole damn thing. I think it's awesome. It's just freaking nuts. Okay, so for those of you who are not watching this on YouTube, for those of you who are watching this on iTunes or SoundCloud or something, um, they have a lot of pictures on this bit. So at some point, you should probably make your way to the YouTube channel, the YouTube video, and just kind of glance at the pictures and stuff, because it's pretty interesting. I mean, the artwork is superb, as always. Jehovah's Witnesses' artwork is really, really fascinating to look at. They also have like a, a lot of charts and graphs and things like that. So let's, let's just take a look at this. On page 25, there's a, a section that says, Understanding Ezekiel's Prophecies. And there are three pictures, and each one has a label. There's a picture for visions, one for illustrations, and one for uh, enactments. So the first picture, visions, is uh, it, it what appears to be a man holding rope, standing in the wind, uh, holding rope and a staff, visions. I, I'm not really sure what that means. Maybe we'll get clarity on that. Then the second one is illustrations. It's a picture of a cook pot sitting uh, on um, above wood and stones, kind of like a campfire. It's a cook pot sitting on a campfire. And then there's enactments, and it's a guy praying. So here's what this section says. Definition, what is prophecy? In the Bible, the Hebrew, the Hebrew verb nava rendered prophecy, refers primarily to declaring an inspired message, judgment, moral teaching, or command from God. It can also refer to making a divine declaration of something to come. Ezekiel's prophecies include all those types of divine revelations. Okay, the next section is methods of delivery. It says, the book of Ezekiel contains visions, illustrations, parables, and, en and enactments of prophetic messages. And then it says fulfillments. Prophecies related by Ezekiel sometimes have more than one fulfillment. For example, the prophecies of restoration had a limited fulfillment when God's people returned to the promised land. But as discussed in chapter 9 of this publication, many of those restoration prophecies have a fulfillment today and will again be fulfilled in the future. In the past, we have viewed a number of elements in Ezekiel's prophecies as the basis for a type-antitype -type fulfillment. I knew they were going to come back to that type-antitype -type thing. This publication, however, refrains from describing any person, object, place, or event as a prophetic type that has a modern antitype, unless there's a clear basis in Scripture for doing so. Okay, so here they're saying... Uh, okay, so they're, now they're defending their choice to apply this whole type anti-type thing. I'll talk about that again in a second. Rather, it will point to the greater fulfillment of many of Ezekiel's prophecies. It will also examine the lessons we can learn from Ezekiel's message, as well as from the people, places, and events mentioned by him. Okay, so this type anti-type thing. I talked about this in one of my videos, like on my main channel, on the Telltale channel. I guess types are... Uh, events or people or things, and then antitypes are the shadows or the reflections of those things. I may have it reversed now. So you've got animal sacrifices, right? That is a type, I guess. And then you've got Jesus coming and dying for everybody. That's the antitype. So the animal's sacrifices was a reflection of what was to come. It was a shadow of what was to come which was, you know, a, a human sacrifice. <laughs> so anyway, it, it's kind of like that. So what they're saying here is they're taking a lot of the ideas and quote-unquote prophecies and, uh, you know, all of the other stuff in this book of Ezekiel, and they're scaling it up to apply to today. They're saying... The things that happened in Ezekiel are a reflection of what's going to happen today or in Armageddon or whatever. 
it's kind of complete bullshit. And it's their way, uh, it's just a weird way of interpreting the Bible. It's a way of them putting themselves in a prophet's position where they can say, we can interpret the Bible and tell you what it says. You can't do this on your own. You need us. So, anyway, that's, you know, that's kind of what they're getting at with this whole type anti-type thing here. Really interesting they mentioned that. I thought for sure they were going to. Okay, so this is part 2b, page 26. It says, Ezekiel, his life and times. Ezekiel means God strengthens. While the prophecies he relates contain many warnings, the overall message is in harmony with the meaning of his name and strengthens the faith of those who want to give God pure worship. Then we've got contemporary prophets listed here. Jeremiah, from a priestly family, served mostly in Jerusalem, 647 to 580 BCE. BCE again, notice. Kind of interesting. And then we've got Huldah, H-U-L-D-A-H. It's a female. Served when the book of the law was discovered in the temple, about 642 BCE. Huh. I don't know that one, Huldah. I don't remember hearing about that, that prophet. But it says contemporary prophets, which means all of these people were alive, supposedly, around the time Ezekiel was alive. Uh, I don't really buy it, but whatever. Uh, then we've got Daniel. Part of the royal tribe of Judah was taken to Babylon in 617 BCE. Okay, Judah was one of the 12 sons of Israel, I believe. Once again, one of the 12 tribes, and apparently it was the royal tribe? I'm not 100% sure what the royal tribe did or what that means exactly, but evidently Daniel was descended from that line. Then we've got Habakkuk. Likely served in Judah early in... Je wait. Oh, i got to pronounce this right. Jeho... Je wait. Jehoiak... Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim's reign. Likely served in Judah early in Jehoiakim's reign. I know I got that wrong, but still, I gave it, a, I gave it my honest best try. <laughs> okay, then we got Obadiah. Prophesied against Edom, likely at the time of Jerusalem's destruction. So, something I want to make note of here is the fact that we're going through this book and it's talking about the Bible a lot, right? And I'm just kind of accepting this stuff. They said... Jeremiah lived, uh, served mostly in Jerusalem, 647 to 580 BCE. I just accepted that because as far as I'm concerned, it's just a story. There's no literal truth to this whatsoever as far as I'm concerned. It's possible that maybe that's real. I don't know. But an added layer to this is the fact that it's coming from Jehovah's Witnesses, and I pretty much don't trust anything they say. I am skeptical of everything that comes out of their literature. Everything. So, by default, I'm kind of assuming that this is incorrect, that it's just a story. It may or may not have any truth value to it. I don't know. I'm going to assume it doesn't. And I figure that we should all probably come from that direction, assuming that there's no truth value in what they're saying in this book. Okay, so right below those six people listed, Jeremiah, Huldah, Daniel, Habakkuk, and Obadiah. Uh, I'm using my Jehovah's Witnesses pronunciation of their names. <laughs> the pronunciations I learned when I was growing up, they may not be correct. Uh, under, under those people, it says, when did they prophesy? All dates BCE. And it, it kind of shows a little chart here of the six prophets showing that they kind of overlapped. So... Ezekiel was like 610 to 590, roughly, uh, give or take. Um, Jeremiah, Obadiah, and Daniel all overlapped with Ezekiel. And then we've got Huldah and Habakkuk. They did not overlap with Daniel. They were a little bit before Daniel. I'm sorry, they didn't overlap with Ezekiel. They were a little bit before Ezekiel, but they were still contemporary with Jeremiah. Um, so... Anyway, I guess they're just kind of talking about, you know, when they, when they were active in, uh, according to the Bible. Then we got this nice big old chart, and then we got a bunch of pictures to look at. Man, these pictures, I'm telling you. Okay, this is the last page. So the chart says, 
key events surrounding Ezekiel's lifetime, all dates BCE. It says 643 born. I guess born means Ezekiel was born, yeah. And then 617 BCE, taken captive to Babylon. Then 613 begins prophesying, sees vision of Jehovah. 612 sees vision of apostasy at the temple. 611, be, so you remember we're counting towards zero now, so this is increasing in years, actually. So 613 is a year after 614. So 612 sees vision of apostasy at the temple. 611 begins to denounce Jerusalem. 609, wife dies and the final siege of Jerusalem begins. And then we've got 607, receives confirmation that Jerusalem has been destroyed. Okay. So right here, in fact, uh, let me just finish this side. 593 sees vision of the temple, then 591 foretells Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Egypt, completes writing. So right here, they're listing 607 as the date that Jerusalem fell, where in reality, actually, we have irrefutable evidence that it was in 586, 587, not 606, 607. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are just stuck on this number, 607, and they need it to be 607 for their math to work out correctly. Long story short, for anybody who isn't watching, or I'm sorry, anybody who's watching that isn't Jehovah's Witness, their whole 1914 prophecy on which every one of their, almost every one of their doctrines hinges is all based on the idea that Jerusalem fell in 607, where in reality it was 587. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail on how this works. If you guys want to find out how it works, you can watch John Cedar's channel breakdown of 1914 and why it's an incorrect date. It's really fascinating, really detailed. But anyways, the, the short version of this is they have cuneiform tablets, which are wedge-shaped tablets that are basically a breakdown um, month to month of every month of every year of that era. And we can place uh, the exact time because they actually listed the configuration of the planets and the stars. To have that exact configuration, it would have had to have been um, thousands of years before or thousands of years later than that time frame. So anyways, yeah, you guys should definitely watch that breakdown if you haven't seen it on the John Cedars channel. Okay, so the right side, this is the last bit here. It says, Kings of Judah and Babylon, 659 to 629. Josiah promotes pure worship, but dies in battle against Pharaoh Necho, N-E-C-H-O-H, Necho. 628, Jeho wait, Jehoahaz, rules badly for three months and is captured by Pharaoh Necho. 628 to 618, Jehoiakim, wait, Jehoiah, Jehoiakim is a bad king and is made a vassal by Pharaoh Necho. God, all these names. This is not going to get easier, I bet. 625, Nebuchadnezzar defeats the Egyptian army. Of course, this is all alleged I'm not taking any of this as actual literal fact, as I said. 620, Nebuchadnezzar invades Judah for the first time and makes Jeho Jehoiakim a vassal in Jerusalem. 618, Jehoiakim rebel, I'm sorry, Jehoiakim rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, but likely dies during the Babylonians' second invasion of the Promised Land. And then 617, uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, also known as Jeconiah, God, these names, is a bad king who rules for three months and then surrenders to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so now this next bit, we're getting to 607. Remember, this is when Jehovah's Witnesses claim Jerusalem fell, and their entire doctrine hinges on these dates, these upcoming dates that they got wrong. 617 to 607. Zedekiah, a wicked, weak-willed king, is made a vassal by Nebuchadnezzar. And then 609, Zedekiah rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, who then invades Judah for a third time. And finally, 607, Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem. 
uh, captures Zedekiah, blinds him, and takes him to Babylon. Um, and, yeah, obviously the, those are all wonky dates, can't be trusted, but yeah, that's the very end of chapter two. Now we've got some really beautiful artwork to look at. Some, I mean, I swear they do such a good job on this stuff, although some of it's really horrifying. Uh, but yeah, so this is the beginning of section one, chapter three. I think this is where we're going to start really getting into some prophecies uh, that Jehovah's Witnesses are, are about to claim and things like that. So it's, it's going to get interesting next time we, we get into this. But anyways, yeah, thanks for coming and listening to me read this, guys.